I recently came across a PragerU video, titled Jordan Peterson Educates Climate Activist. In this video, a person in the audience asks Peterson about his stance on tackling large-scale problems, like climate change, which requires collective action. Peterson's response is presented as educational. As far as I can tell, it's a simple red herring. But, enough intro, let's get to it. Don't forget to click the subscribe and notification buttons. So what is your advice to young people when you talk about you need to be individually responsible, but when there are things that are so far out of our control, like climate catastrophe, like the precarious job economy, like you know, the They're economic crisis, what, what, is, you what, think. Is, what is your answer I mean, to do you people think that who are you're facing these questions? Your, do you think that you're worse off than your grandparents? I think there are different challenges. Do you think you're worse off than your grandparents? And there it is. The red herring. Rather than directly answering the person's question, Peterson reframes with a question of his own, and demands a yes or a no answer, even though he avoided answering her question. In any case, I'm guessing Peterson wanted to redirect this to the standard Prajuru non sequitur about how fossil fuels have made it possible to overcome various natural hazards and live a safer and more comfortable life. 300 years ago, human beings spent a lot of time breathing polluted air from indoor fires. As unhealthy as it was, it was worth the warmth. But we've been able to conquer all these environmental hazards. And we did most of this using machines running on cheap, plentiful, reliable energy from fossil fuels. As if our historical use of fossil fuels somehow means that it's impossible to make the switch to clean energy, now that we actually have the knowledge and means to do so. Yes, we no longer have to heat our homes using an indoor fire, because we have electricity. Yay! Achievement unlocked. We have electricity. Switching to cleaner electricity, isn't the same as shunning electricity. It means we keep the baby without the bathwater. Prageyu likes to pretend the baby and bathwater are inseparable. The lady in the audience was bringing up a valid point. Some changes require everyone's involvement, so individual choices aren't going to cut it. The argument I think is that individual responsibility does not change um, the climate, does not fix the problem that needs global collective responsibility. So I think that's the core of the question. Do you have a, a theory about that? Well, fundamentally, I'm a psychologist and my experience has been that people can do a tremendous amount of good for themselves and for the people who are immediately around them by looking to their own inadequacies and their own flaws and the things that they're not doing in their lives and starting to build themselves up as more powerful individuals. And if they're capable of doing that... In other words, no, he doesn't. He's going to avoid the fact that slashing emissions to avoid baking the planet and causing massive famines, droughts, far worse natural disasters, resource wars, and faunal displacement even extinctions requires a collective approach. And then they're capable of expanding their career. And if they're capable of expanding their career and their competence, then they're capable of taking their place in the community as effective leaders. And then they're capable of making wise decisions instead of unwise decisions when it comes to making collective political decisions. But what does Jordan Peterson mean by wise versus unwise decisions? You see, he has another video where he repeats some of the standard climate change denier talking points. Is he implying that the wise decisions follow the climate change denier talking points and the unwise decisions follow the actual science? More on that in a future video where I unpack a different video where Peterson parrots some of the standard templated climate change denier narrative. I'm not suggesting in the least and have never suggested that there's no domain for social action. I'm suggesting that people who don't have their own houses in order should be very careful before they go about reorganizing the world. This is the answer you'd expect from someone who sells a suite of self-help products and who is affiliated with Praga U, who is funded by fossil fuel industry titans. Peterson's prescription is before you pay attention and call attention to how we humans are baking the planet that you and your children will have to live on and have to deal with the repercussions, just get your own house in order, whatever that even means. 
maybe in X amount of years, well after the window of opportunity to seriously mitigate the effects of climate change has passed, you can do some real good in your local community, especially if it's not underwater, or burnt down. And what does he even mean by reorganizing the world? Is calling attention to a clear and present danger the same as reorganizing the world? Which happens in many ways. <laughs> so, are you, can, just, can, can I just, just to... If a young person believes that the uh, climate, the global warming um, problem on the climate is something that needs to be tackled quickly, and they can't wait until they grow up and become prime ministers to do it, do, do you think collective responsibility overrides individual responsibility in a huge issue like that? No. <laughs> okay. I don't. I, I think that generally, I think that generally, I think that generally people, I think generally people have things that are more within their personal purview that are more difficult to deal with and that they're avoiding and that generally the way they avoid them is by adopting uh, pseudo moralistic stances on large scale social issues so that they look good to their friends and their neighbors. That's what it looks like. So never mind the real and tangible dangers of climate change. Peterson wants to focus on instances of people trying to look good for their friends. He's not even willing to entertain the possibility that these activists are sincere in their worries about the repercussions of climate change. He's just assuming that they're trying to look good in front of their friends. Cynical much? Never mind the amnesty poll, which shows that this is a legitimate concern among young people today. Why bother with facts, when they contradict your political narrative? Who cares if people in developing nations are going to face food and water shortages? So what if coastal flooding and wildfires are increasing and displacing people and even causing loss of human life? So what if we're looking at an increase in resource wars and extinctions? The real danger is that some young people might be using the reality of climate change to avoid facing personal challenges. Things were so much better off when young people simply used reality TV, video games, and mind-altering substances as a distraction, right? Heaven forbid they turn their attention to issues that actually affect the quality and even existence of life on this planet. Furthermore, note the implication that these two things are mutually exclusive. As if you can't grow as an individual while being active in something you believe in. In fact, as someone who's read a ton of these mindset books, including Jordan Peterson's book, by the way, I've noticed that believing in a higher cause is a recurring theme. It's an important part of growing as an individual. A major difference between the right and the left concerns the way each seeks to improve society. Conservatives believe that the way to a better society is almost always through the moral improvement of the individual, by each person doing battle with his or her own weaknesses and flaws. Good one, Dennis Praga. So if I'm concerned with our CO2 output and how it's resulting in climate change that's baking the planet and increasing the severity of natural disasters, resulting in increased droughts, famines, resource wars, and faunal extinctions, instead of spreading the word and dispelling ignorance, what I really should be doing is working on myself and only working on myself. Because I can only do one or the other. It's almost as if Praga is simply regurgitating what the fossil fuel industry wants him to say. It's almost as if Praga U is merely a propaganda wing of a few wealthy families, while carrying on the facade of being a well-intentioned educational organization. Really, this should not be a right versus left issue. Pulling together to not bake the planet our children inherit shouldn't even be part of the Overton window. In fact, it's only been over the last few decades, that the right and the left have been split on this topic. Historically speaking, Republican administrations have been more environmentally friendly. This unfortunately ended with Richard Nixon. After this, it's only Democrats on the list of top eco-friendly presidents. Pothola54, who is perhaps the most prominent YouTuber when it comes to climate change, dubs himself a conservative. I absolutely suggest checking out his channel. 
I will link to his channel in the description. In the meantime, here is an excerpt from one of his videos. Oceans are slowly acidifying as more CO2 is dissolved and that's causing problems for coral and plankton growth. As corals begin to die, more coastal land is exposed to erosion from waves and storm surges. Ecosystems are being disrupted as organisms become extinct. Because it's not just the rise in temperatures that's a problem, temperatures have risen much more in the past, it's the rate at which they're rising that's causing problems for organisms that can't move fast enough to adapt. As for hurricanes, as I showed in a previous video, they'll be less frequent, but the ones that do occur will be much stronger. A warmer Arctic will send winter Arctic weather further south. Before you start wondering how Georgia and West Virginia can possibly get colder in winter if the world is supposed to be getting warmer, remember it's called global warming because the whole globe is warming on average. So although temperatures may have been way below average where you were this winter, it was way above average further north in the Arctic. But there is one effect of global warming that seems the most innocuous but may end up being the most damaging of all. Warming the planet leads to a phenomenon called positive feedback, which amplifies the warming. So as ice melts, there's less of a white surface on the Earth to reflect the sun's energy and more dark water to absorb it. That warms the Earth even further. As the tundra warms, permafrost melts and releases methane, another powerful greenhouse gas that warms the Earth even more. And as the oceans warm, they become less able to absorb CO2, which is less soluble in warmer water, and that causes higher concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, which warms the Earth further. So now we come to the really important question, at least to climate critics. What should we call this? In the past, the term used for anthropogenic global warming was a simple acronym, AGW, but in 2007, the term CAGW was coined, that's catastrophic anthropogenic global warming. The argument now seems to be that, OK, anthropogenic global warming might be real. I suppose that's progress, but it's not going to be catastrophic. Now, I can't tell you whether the effects we'll see from climate change will be catastrophic, because I don't know what the climate critics mean by it. How we feel about something doesn't matter, and it doesn't change either the facts or the projections. But if we have to tack an adjective onto AGW, perhaps it should be E for expensive. Because while we can't objectively measure how catastrophic something is, we can estimate the cost. If we take just sea level rise alone, millions of properties representing trillions of dollars worth of assets will be permanently lost to a higher sea level in the top 20 cities at risk. Then we have to add the increased cost of damage from hurricanes, because although there'll be fewer of them, each one that does happen will be longer lasting and more powerful. Researchers estimate total damage from hurricanes will increase by about 30% in real terms. Then add the cost of the fishing industry and agriculture. And, well, the report has already done the sums for us. In 2006, the Stern Review estimated the cost of climate change will be at least 5% of world GDP over the next 200 years, but that figure rises to 20% if feedbacks and other factors are taken into account. Of course, you can always argue that these estimates are too high, in which case, what is the cost? However you want to work it out, it seems that the cost is so high that it's much easier for some people to pretend that the problem doesn't exist in the first place. Let's misquote the science and change all the graphs and blame it on the sun or galactic rays. Let's pretend the ice isn't melting and sea levels aren't rising and that there's no correlation between CO2 and temperature. That way we don't even need to look at the cost. And let's suggest that fixing the problem will bring an end to world civilization. Now some politicians want to label carbon dioxide a pollutant. Imagine if they succeed. What would our lives be like then? I'm not alarmed by these scary videos any more than I'm alarmed by climate change. That's right. Climate change doesn't alarm me because we identified the problem decades ago, we know the cause, and there's no reason why human will and ingenuity can't fix it. Countries that accept climate science are already starting to develop clean energy technologies that were unheard of a decade ago, and on the other side of the coin they're also becoming much more energy efficient. 
so much so that it's now possible to have buildings that don't use any net energy and households that not only produce their own electricity but sell a surplus back to the grid. Already Denmark gets nearly a third of its electricity from wind power. It's possible to make gasoline from waste biomass that would otherwise rot on the ground. Research is going into fuel cells that can store and transport energy much more efficiently. And we haven't even scratched the surface of what future technologies might be able to achieve. Of course, these technologies, even combined with greater energy efficiency, will never completely replace fossil fuels because our energy demands are just too large. But they don't have to. They just have to reduce CO2 emissions and slow down the warming. Eventually, humankind will have the technology to manage nuclear fusion, which will give us unlimited clean energy. But only if we put enough effort and resources into the research. And that's the problem. The amount we've spent on developing the world's first nuclear fusion reactor is barely two-thirds the cost of the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico three years ago. So, no, I'm not alarmed by climate change because we do know how to mitigate the problem and eventually fix it if we apply our minds to it and recognize that there is a problem. What does alarm me is that people are so badly educated in basic science that they're willing to blindly believe the misleading crap they read in blogs and newspapers. I'm alarmed at the willingness of politicians to ignore the science because they don't understand it and turn instead to their own beliefs. In other words, I'm not alarmed by a problem that our intelligence will allow us to mitigate. I'm alarmed at our ignorance and gullibility that leads us to willfully ignore it.